What is up Waffle Gang? I do hope you are well. My name is Mark and today we're having a bit of a takeaway. I'm fancying something a little bit more spicy so we're going with r slash pro revenge. <laughs> and if you love a reddit story why not consider hitting that like, that subscribe, maybe that notification bell too. And let's jump straight in to the good stuff. Much love guys. And this story comes from Living Bunch 6371, titled, They kicked out my sister-in-law when she came out, so I forced them to sell the same house. My sister-in-law came out as a trans woman when she was 18. My wonderful in-laws kicked her out of the house then and there. They told her to leave the house and throw her out at 8 p.m. with no money or even any documents, and her father took the car keys from her too. She had to walk eight miles to get to our place. She was crying and we took her in. This is horrible behavior, but my husband and I would have just cut them off if it was all they did, but they doubled down. They refused to hand over any documents and my brother-in-law had to go over and barge into the house to get them. They also cleaned up all the money in a joint account. She had saved up 8K working part-time all through high school. They took the money and sold her car, which was in their name. They were trying to ruin her life as much as they could. My father-in-law is a small-time businessman and his biggest account was supplying my employer. I had helped him get the contract and it was very lucrative for him. My employer was in a family business and they treated long-term employees more like family than as employees. I was talking to my boss about what happened. He told me that if I could find someone within 5% range of the price my father-in-law offered, they would make the switch. My father-in-law offered really great rates. He was good at his job, but he had fucked up the contract because even though we always bought from him, we weren't obligated to buy from him. We could switch suppliers anytime, but he got complacent and assumed we wouldn't switch suppliers. It took me six months of painful searching to find a supplier who could replace him and get us great rates. This was not a major part of my duties and I had to put in way more hours than normal to find the damn supplier. But when I did find them, I waited for a month before informing my boss. See, my in-laws had been planning to do a major renovation for a long time and it involved tearing down a major portion of their house. I waited until the renovation work had truly started before informing my boss. We started to get supplies from the new supplier the next month itself. It crushed his business, it fucked his unit economics and had to scramble to find new customers. They ended having to sell their house to save the business and they didn't get a good rate for it because the house was well half torn down when they sold it. My in-laws did try to get money from my brother-in-law but he told them to fuck off. My father-in-law is a decent businessman and he did crawl his way out of the hole they dug for themselves, but even after eight years later, they still haven't bought a new house. I've heard they are still sour about what happened. I mean, I was just doing my job and if they had just kicked her out, they would still have the house. That's absolutely amazing of OP to stand with their sister-in-law like this. I always think, you know, two parents, they think their parents have been with them for this long and the moment they come out, they turn on them just like that. And I think, how can you do that? How can you, your feelings just suddenly turn like that? And I've got no doubt it happens. You know, we've read it many, many times over and I've seen so many stories that like it. But I always find it incredibly heartbreaking. Imagine the feelings knowing your parents just turn on you like that. My word. But Big Bad Bogeyman says... As a father, I really don't understand how you can suddenly be so awful to your child after they tell you something that is completely out of their control. How does that even work? Do you instantly stop loving them? Death by Snooze News says, I couldn't think of a better way to treat a person after they treated someone as less than one. Good job. Beer Buckache says, love this one. Thank you for standing by her. The suicide rate of trans teens and LGBTQ teens is tragic. Opie replied to that saying, we were worried about her for a while, but she is a tough woman and she got back up and is thriving right now. She got a CS degree from an amazing college and is working for a cool startup and has a loving girlfriend. Duncan here says, every time I hear a story about a parent turning their back on their child after coming out, disowning them, throwing them out of the house, etc. I remember there are actual horrible children that get support from their parents, murderers, rapists, gang bangers, drug dealers, etc whose parents stand by them when shit goes down. 
If I, their son, tell them I like other men, they are willing to never communicate with me again. But if I told them I killed someone in a rage at a bar, they would call me a lawyer, visit me in prison, and be my character witness. It is weird, isn't it? When I came to the realization I was gay, I thought that my family would be less ashamed if I was someone who killed other people rather than the man who wants to kiss another man. I should reflect on the OP post too. Fuck over as many heartless people as you can in life. They would do it. So maybe you're taking away their means to hurt someone else in the future. And one more from broad literature who says the whole point of parents legally having someone in their name that is actually the child is based off the assumption that no parent would ever needlessly take from their child. People are horrible and the assumption is just wrong. For real, some people just don't deserve to be parents. Now, what do you guys make of our first story? What do you think about the revenge? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and we'll move on to the next one. And our next story comes from DJ Duke of Spook who says, when your ex tells you to move out while she's on a work trip because the guy she cheated on you with is moving in, you get very creative moving out. I had originally posted this response to a question in r slash unethical pro-life tips and was told this would be appreciated here. Enjoy. I did this to an ex who asked me to move out while she was on a work trip and told me she was coming back with her new boyfriend. We were still together when she left. I got these little noisemakers, battery powered ones, the size of a quarter that emits sounds at just the right volume, that you aren't sure if you really heard it. So quiet that two people could be sitting in an average sized room and while one could barely hear it, the other wouldn't hear a thing. They last ages and fit perfectly in light fixtures and in wall outlets. I got a box of 20 of them for like $100 on eBay and got so creative all over the house. Her car, I even hid them in a boat her father got her. Rich family and she grew up sailing. Now these little bastards make a noise at a complete random intervals. Could be minutes, could be hours, could take a whole day off. They cycle noises like children laughing, a dying breath as they called it, a whistle, scratching noises, some other ones I can't remember but you get the idea. It was so unpredictable, it was near impossible for someone to just figure it out. Months go by, I get a new place, get my life back up. Now we had a few friends in common and one of them I kept up with. They were kind of sour about how she ended things but they had grown up together and kept up the friendship, loosely talking and catching up on occasion. I never really asked about her but one day we get to talking and he's wanting to prank some friends on a camping trip so I tell him about the noisemakers. As I'm telling about them, he slowly starts making this face, like he's gradually losing his shit. He's got this huge grin on his face and asks me, you put these in X's shit, didn't you? And when I admit, he starts laughing hysterically. Turns out her new boyfriend had only lasted a few months and had left telling her that he couldn't handle whatever was going on with them and their mental states. Turns out for a while they had both heard things and sometimes only one would hear them, which gave the illusion that something really fucked with them was going on in their heads at different times. They couldn't figure it out and eventually he wanted out completely. And having run down all the crazy list of shit people who are hearing voices, the thing ended it believing he had been infected with some brain worm the government was putting in vaccines or something like that. It was amazing. I hadn't expected to hear anything about it. I rode that train for weeks. When it went away, I got another hit of that high. She moved out, told her parents she didn't want the house and to give it to her brother or sell it. Wouldn't tell them why. I always tell people who ask her about that, I hold no grudge and don't tell them the part where I totally fucked with her so bad, I overshot the got her backstage and hit the blissful state of satisfied with my work. My wife knows this story by heart because it's her favorite one to tell. <laughs> And there's a couple of little stories within the story here, which I absolutely love. One from Bubbly Cartographer 31 who says, We had a co-worker who was extremely argumentative all the time. It was never her fault, and when it clearly was, she'd get all defensive trying to blame her incompetence on everyone else. My co-worker grew tired of her bitching and decided to get even with her by removing one of these from a Christmas card. He hid it in the ceiling right over the desk while it played jingle bells incessantly. That thing lasted six months. She would always call us in the office asking if we had heard anything. It was audible enough we could hear it, but pretended we didn't. It drove her absolutely nuts for months till the battery finally ran down. As the OP said, you cannot pinpoint the location of the noise. Those bastards last for ages. Edit, one thing I failed to mention is he would remove it sometimes for about a week, put a paperclip in it so it wouldn't play, throw it in his desk drawer and then put it back in the ceiling later. 
And let's just have one more from Infernal Dragon Boner who says, I got one of these noise emitter things as a random stocking stuffer for a Christmas years ago. Set the thing to, psst, can you hear me? And stuck it to the ceiling fan in my dad's office as a bit of a prank, but without any malicious intent or really any forethought. Fast forward a few months, I found out that my dad couldn't even hear it because he worked with heavy machinery practically his whole life. My mum though, she was convinced the ghost of her mother was haunting the house. When she found the little device on the ceiling fan, she was not very happy with me. <laughs> now, what do you guys make of this one? And let us know your thoughts in the comments below and we'll move on to another story. And the next story is from Call Me Swellington. I was fired for inadvertently stumbling on my boss's malfeasance. I used his obsession with golf and watches to get him fired. This was in the last throes of the analog mid-90s, fax machines, FedEx, dial-up computing, and voicemail were the most common business tools. I was a young regional sales manager for a major branded consumer product. I covered the grocery class of trade in 11 western states. My division worked out of Chicago and had a home office on the west coast. I had made my reputation by typically making my quota and keeping costs within budget. I would get reassigned to struggling markets and more often than not, I would usually make my sales number. Nothing too fancy, I just figured where the best opportunities were and concentrated on them. In those days, we had something called Market Development Funds, MDF, or as we call it, Making Days Fun in the time before such things were deemed illegal. It was money we could literally use for almost anything you could imagine. Whining and dining, sending buyers to the Super Bowl, taking them on market research trips. I once took six honchos for a weekend of fishing in Mexico. As long as you had the receipts and your boss knew, except in cases where they specifically asked not to know, we were free to spend money as we saw fit. This was old school mad men style slush funds, all tax deductible. Typically, the MDF money was 2% of your total annual gross sales and was use it or lose it, meaning it had to be spent because it wouldn't roll over. I always had some left over. As a team player, I would let my boss, Sasquatch, know so he could use it. No big deal. Towards the end of the year, my weekly FedEx pack from the company started including sign-offs for payments to a supplier I'd never heard of before. What was weird is they were for a demo company that wasn't one of my regional suppliers. If you have never been offered a sample or a coupon in a grocery store, that was a demo company. I called the broker slash agent in that market and learned that they had never used the company or even heard of them. I finally figured out that they were from Sasquatch and that he had thrown them in with my other sign-offs. I called him and asked if he knew what they were. He said that they should be assigned to my NDF and not to worry about them. This was a little unusual because demos would normally be taken out of other monies or came down from marketing. Whatever, I signed off on them. Hung out to dry. About three months later, I was called into HQ for a meeting where I was told I was being transferred to a market that I'd never worked before and would require to locate. At the time, my wife was pregnant. Read her pro-revenge story in my feed. And we just started an extensive remodel on our newly purchased house. The company had some relocation benefits, but it was just too hectic to pull up the routes and move to Southeast. I declined the offer and was told that I could look for another job within the company or receive a severance package. I wound up taking the severance. The truth comes to light. Several months later, one of the ex-co-workers told me that my region had been taken over by one of the Sasquatch's past work associates who managed to get hired in my spot and that the region was tanking, badly. Nothing made sense. Why was I terminated and then replaced by someone who lived in another city and couldn't do the job? I started to think in my naivety that I may have put a target on my back. After some research and digging, which was much harder before the internet, I learned that the, the demo company bidding the MDF was based in my ex-boss's previous city and was just a PO box, a telephone and a DBA registered by the new person in my job. I later found out it was his girlfriend slash mistress. I was livid. Like most people, I tend to plan revenge in my head but never really go through with it. Most of the time it's a coping mechanism and not very useful in moving past being wronged. But this was so egregious, so uncalled for and so disruptive for my life, I felt I had to get even. My plan evolved to take this guy down, whatever the time it took, whatever the cost in lives or money. 
I was going to get this mofo. I may have been able to ran him out to the company, but they might have dismissed my complaint as coming from a disgruntled ex-employee with an axe to grind, the hook. I decided that I was going to approach the guy as a phony recruiter, not just a guy collecting resumes, but as a retained corporate headhunter, someone paid to onboard people for big jobs. I'd spent a year early in my career working for a super exclusive headhunting firm and knew exactly what transpired in the process. My subterfuge required international telexes, phony letterhead, faked English accents, and overseas friends to do my bidding. Sasquatch was obsessed with expensive watches in golf. He played regularly and watched pro golf both on TV and live. He would incessantly chatter on about both subjects. To bait him, I arranged for him to be approached for an executive position with a major Swiss watch company for a position tied to pro golf and other swanky sports, sponsorships, and included a shopping list of benefits and perquisites. The job would require hobnobbing with major sports organizers, flying around the world, first class, and basically spending money. It was a job he could only dream of. The setup. In the slow and methodical long con, I strung him along until the time was right to close with an offer. The only catch was that he had to report to Switzerland for final offer and onboarding. I deliberately scheduled it for a week of the old jobs division meetings and reporting. They were mandatory and impossible to miss without raising red flags. Sasquatch was worried that his absence would be impossible to cover, especially if he was out of the country. The headhunting firm said they could move the appointment up a few days so that he would be able to attend his meeting, but that he would need to purchase an unrestricted business class seat and make his own hotel reservations. Save your receipts and the watch company will reimburse you, he was told. Sasquatch showed up to his swanky hotel suite using his own credit card for the expensive room and promptly received a note from the watch company that his appointment had to be rescheduled for the following Monday because of a major corporate crisis. Sasquatch called the phony recruiter in a panic about missing the corporate meetings back in the States. It was agreed that he would call in sick and that whatever happened with the old job, he was heading to much greener fairways. <laughs> Enjoy your weekend in Europe. By Monday, you'll be in the dream job. The Sting While Sasquatch was calling his jets in Europe, I nonchalantly called his boss, the president of the division, and casually asked for a reference on Sasquatch's work ethic and dates of employment. You'd be surprised how often this mistake happens. The president, to his credit, didn't tip his hand or act very surprised by the call. But like a good corporate wonk, he referred me to human resources. I let it slip that he was in Europe, finalizing his new job and that he'd already given the company notice. My bad. Bloody aftermath and how the revenge overstepped this original mission. Eventually, I was able to put together the aftermath from old co-workers and other people in the trade, who did not know I was the revenge ninja. When Monday came and went, Sasquatch must have been apoplectic. This is to be assumed since we had cut all communications to let him twist in the wind because we received at least 20 calls to the exchange and multiple faxes. Sasquatch hung around the hotel for a day or two, then finally decided to leave for home. I assume at some point he may have contacted the watch company, but I never confirmed it. When he finally got home, he found his office had been packed up and left with his wife. A HR person met him offsite to give him his severance and retrieve the car and other company property. I heard his wife left him sometime later and his mistress was fired for theft. I figured he spent at least 10k on travel in the hotel. Epilogue. I wish I could say I tipped my hand and told Sasquatch that I was the author of his demise, but it really served no purpose and in theory may have exposed me to some retribution of my own. By my moral lodestar, I got even with a thief who was content to steal and take my livelihood. That was plenty. Sicilian Alzheimer's. Never forget an offense. Very humbled that this blew up and I'd been accused of having a cold heart on those who have slighted me. I'm not too proud to admit there were some revenge plans that backfired or were never implemented. I'm an argumentative son of a bitch and comfortable enough in my own skin to take a few random jabs and some healthy skepticism from Redditors. I defend myself in the hope that someone will learn that there are indeed times when revenge is appropriate. My real world experiences came before the internet, doxing, ghosting, texting, social media, Google, and all the other stuff that makes people sure everything is a scam. I've had some fun and memorable experiences in my life. The story of Sasquatch is true and less complicated than you'd think. The key to any confident scam, literally the word con comes from confidence, is the confidence the mark puts on the con artist. 
Sasquatch was a Swiss watch fanboy. He wore expensive models and knew everything there was to know about rare watches and their complications. Additionally, he lived for golf, played golf, watched golf, anything golf. So when my real recruiter friend from the UK called him and said, my Swiss client is, is confidentially putting together a hospitality ambassador position in the US. We're looking for someone who knows golf and other sports, knows watches and is comfortable with a high level of interactions at a six figure salary with a huge travel budget, car and entertainment allowances, free or low cost access to the best watches in the world and a budget to set up a small team of minions. How hard do you think it would be for him to recruit Sasquatch? A few faxes from a third party, a phone call or two, and some cobbled together letterhead, and the guy was hooked. If Sasquatch harbored any concerns that it was fake, he certainly would have refused to lay out travel expenses. I myself have fronted travel money while interviewing, so it really wasn't much of a reach. I'd say that revenge isn't always pleasant, and sometimes I think it feels a little sickening. These are the consequences of this type of action. As I age, I agree to a certain extent that living well is the best revenge, but only after someone pays for what they did. Holy moly. Imagine being in that hotel and just watching this guy turn up. He's all excited. You know, he's going to get his dream job to do with watches, golf. You know, everything's working out perfect. He turns up to this hotel and suddenly everything starts going wrong. Imagine the panic in that hotel room. Some absolute crazy level revenge there. But... What do you guys make of today's revenge stories? Did you enjoy them? Would you like to hear more of them? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below as always, and I will see you in the next one. Take care, guys. Much love.